Welcome, not just uh, Joseph, but also this little baby and the family uh, to whom this little baby belongs. Um, they're all part of the story that I have to tell, uh, the story of God's creation uh, as it goes. But I think I find it hard to continue the conversation with a baby in hand. <laughs> I need one hand to um, run this. Um, now, th thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you, Paul and Irene, for asking me to talk. I'll just get this a little bit more closer. Um, I want to start off with this, uh, can I say, current topic. It seems to be current everywhere. Um, I don't think anybody needs to be told what Roe versus Wade is. Uh, there are people who hail this, saying this is uh, great. Now, the US is going to show the way forward for the rest of the world. And uh, then there's half of the population that says, oh, how terrible. This is uh, not the way to go. Um, how could this be? Uh, we are actually turning the clock backwards. But what I want to show here is a clip that I took out of Abraham Lincoln's speech uh, several cent two centuries ago during the civil, civil rights movement um, in the US. Or was it the, yes, I think it was the uh, Civil War uh, in the 18th century. He says, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. I think I can say the same about Roe versus Wade. There are Christians on the Democrats, and there are Christians on the Republicans. Uh, there are people who believe in the same God who are both far right and far left. I'm not here to solve the problem. I'm not here to tell you what the solution is. And I'm not here to talk about primarily abortions or termination of pregnancy. But I'm just going to talk a little bit of beginnings, the story of beginnings, the wonder of our beginnings, which you all saw in that little baby, my own little beginnings in India and here in Australia, the beginning of all things, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, uh, Genesis chapter 1 to 3 maybe, and the beginnings of human life, and uh, I can't see what I've got it here, the beginning of when uh, the end is decided, and that's about abortions, and the need for some new beginnings. Sorry, there are too many beginnings there. Actually, it's amazing how we are formed, all of us, start on, starting off as two little cells. And it's no wonder that the psalmist says uh, fearfully and wonderfully, am I made? I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You created my inmost being, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Fortunately, they didn't know it was in the mother's womb that the baby was formed by them. Uh, but this is David, so you know, it's not 5,000 years ago, it's maybe, what, 3,000 years ago. Um, of course, he says something about being made together in the depths of the earth. That may be an exaggeration by the poetic license that David takes here. Your eyes saw my unformed body. And uh, we have the privilege now of being able to see these unformed body. You know, through our sound. I mean, every parent, uh, every grandparent who comes to the scanning session wants to see this and be delighted by what they see. But it is even beyond all of this, the genetic code, uh, three billion base pairs that starts off giving instructions of various kinds. We're just two cells becoming a ball of cells. And this ball of cells are automatically forming bones and skin and eyes and brain and gut and whatnot. If there was ever a DIY manual that was complex and perfect, the DIY manual that comes together when a man and woman get together is, is it. It sets up a factory to make itself. It has all the instructions to make itself. It resources all the raw material that it needs. And when the product is finished, it dismantles the factory. I have not heard of anything like this uh, in all of this planet, other than in reproduction. 
Yes, indeed, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, this ball of cells not only has to decide which shall be front, which shall be back, which shall be left side, which shall be right side, where shall the heart go, where should the lungs go, how should the fingers form, how should the toes be formed. Each of these instructions are given uh, and the plan unfolds. And of course, sometimes the plan goes wrong, but we'll talk about that later. But we'll talk about this beginning. And of course, Marianne kindly mentioned a few of those things. I studied in Valo in India, the Christian Medical College, um, and graduated from there. Um, I worked in a fancy hospital in Bangalore and then moved to this mud hut hospital uh, in uh, a remote part of uh, India uh, so that we could serve the First Nations people. Uh, you, you may not believe it, but that's how our hospital ran. Uh, Keith would have seen some of these uh, pictures. Of course, Keith's been there. Um, he's sitting quietly there. Uh, the uh, mother hos hospital became an eight bed hospital, and the eight bed hospital became a um, 40 bed hospital within a few years. I don't know, if you have magnifying glasses, you'll find Roshni, my daughter, who's 21 now, who was only one year old, or a few months old, somewhere in one of those photographs. Uh, so that was the 40-bed hospital uh, that we built from scratch, uh, grace of God. We had uh, teaching everyone with all wisdom as the, as the theme. Uh, the fish uh, was our identity, as a Christian identity. The Red Cross, our medical competence, and the bow and arrow was the context of the First Nation people. But we also knew that in spite of having a good hospital, people were dying around us, and we had to set up a complex community health program, teaching women who were almost completely illiterate about illness and how to treat. And they went home with uh, tablets for malaria, oral rehydration, and how to look after pregnant women. We did have this as a, you know, as a calling almost, that we would walk to the edge of all that we, all the light we had. And when we push the boundaries beyond and have to take that step into the darkness of the unknown, that we would believe one of two things would happen. That we would find something solid to stand on, or we would be taught to fly. And I didn't realize that the step of darkness, the darkness of the unknown that we had to take, was a step into Australia. We had believed that we were going to spend all of our life among these First Nations people. But our family circumstances um, sort of moved us to uh, shift to Australia. And I found that Australia was so different. Here, people thought of you as a provider of services. Like you go and ask for a cup of coffee. How would you like it? You know, half strength, full strength, uh, full, you know, milk, coffee, you know, what? I don't know what. You know, I, you know, you ask for it, you get it. You expect to get it. Uh, and that's what. The same thing gets translated when you come to the hospital. You want uh, music, you want candles, you want uh, what you want when you are birthing. Not that you shouldn't have it, okay. Uh, faith, uh, I could talk about God and I could share about Christ freely in, 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 in the India, but whereas in Australia, it was a very hard thing. In fact, when I started working in the government hospital in Adelaide, they told me very clearly, uh, please, Keep your faith to yourself. And how was I different from anybody else? Because everybody was kind and compassionate, it seemed, at least outwardly, uh, as they cared for patients. So it was a tough, tough transition from, uh, from working among First Nations people in India uh, or living in India, where spirituality is very high among <coughs> people. Maybe a false kind of spirituality, but it was still high to a post-modern, post-Christian Australia. But I trained in fetal medicine in Adelaide and moved to the Martha Mothers Hospital, um, worked in the maternal fetal medicine unit where we uh, look after babies who, are, who had their instructions gone wrong and things are not uh, completely right. And we do perform a lot of fetal procedures in utero minimally invasive, and actually open fetal surgery. So that whole thing comes up as a notion. How is fetus? Is it a patient? You know, does it have rights? 
uh, who gives the rights, you know? And does the mother say yes or does the mother say no? Uh, if the mother say no, says no, what happens? Uh, is it right just to terminate a baby who could be operated on and fixed? What happens when a baby that cannot live or cannot survive? Um, all kinds of issues, you know, uh, how do we look at that? And then this whole area of prenatal diagnosis. Yes, it's good to know, you know, whether your baby is all right or not. But you want to know everything about your baby, you know, how much do you want to know? Um, we are moving into a field where it is not just amnu and CVS to tell whether the baby has Down syndrome or Edward syndrome, but we are moving into an area where we can make genetic diagnosis and do whole exome and whole genome sequencing to say what the baby's risks of uh, having a problem, maybe when the baby is 40 or when the baby is 60. Why do we want to have all this information? I don't know. And the rapid changes in medical care and medical treatment is what's really daunting. Um, where do we go? You know, Are we just doctors who treat? Roddy? <laughs> Are uh, we doctors who are going to tell people this is your risk? He wanted me to have a what is it C C T C A or something just to tell me whether I'll have a heart attack or something of that sort, or whether I need an angio. Uh, what, what? How much do I want to know? What are the risks that I want to know? Uh, and this whole thing brings about a whole lot of problems with the ethical application of science and technology. What are we right in doing? How much should we do? or how much should we not be doing is a question that I ask myself. And the dilemma of decision making. What do you do when you have multiple choices? If you have to choose between two good things, yeah, well, all right, you might choose a good thing. But what if your choices are two bad things? What do you do? How, how does a mother make a choice between a baby that will die at birth or towards term or letting the baby die after birth and watching the baby die? I don't know. I find it very hard to talk to a family who, after we have scanned and done the test, we know that the baby is going to die. Whether the baby will die at 34 weeks or 38 weeks or at birth, I don't know. How does the mother make a decision then? Well, I have a mother here who's not had to make that kind of a very hard decision, but she still she had to make some, some decisions. And that's the mother whose baby I was carrying. And this was a baby who forgot to make his fingers and hand properly. And I won't say anything more about that. I'll ask Katie to come and say a few words. It's just fortunate that this is not prepared. <laughs> just so happened that she's here. And I <laughs> Hi, I'm Katie, and this is Nathan. Um, and he's our third baby. We have two little girls, five and almost three, who are very normal in terms of their development. Um, and yeah, in January at our 20 week scan, at a, you know, QML, not, not QML, somewhere, I can't even remember where we had the scan. Um, uh, the, the ultrasound tech was just a, a little bit funny. Um, and I thought it was because COVID, Omicron, everything was really stressful, and my husband's hay fever was playing up that day. Uh, and so I thought she was just feeling really awkward because it was, yeah, because he was sneezing a lot. Um, but then we got a call from our GP that night saying, uh, did they say anything about the baby? I'm like, no. Uh, it's probably fine. We have a very lovely um, GP who I'm, I'm reasonably certain is a Christian. Um, and she, she said, well, they couldn't find the baby's hand. Um, and so the following week we had another scan, this time at the mother. Um, and yeah, they had a you know, quick look. Yes, his heart is beating, all well, that's good. And then looked at his arms and it's a bit hard to tell from here, but he's got one kind of long arm with slightly strange fingers and one very short arm um, with two fingers and a thumb with think. Um, it's a bit hard to tell if the thumb is a thumb or just another finger. Um, and then they went, to check that everything else was okay and they weren't actually confident that everything else was okay. Um, and so for most of the pregnancy we were expecting that when he was born he would need surgery after a day or two because we didn't think his esophagus was connected. Um, and then if 
it was particularly bad. He was going to have to stay in the hospital and have another surgery at, at kind of two months old. Um, and people have prayed very much for this little one. And when he was born, none of that actually was the case. It was, it was just the limb things that were different, um, which we're very grateful for. But there was a period there kind of between 20 and 26 weeks where it was hard. Um, it was hard, like at first it was like, oh, probably like it's probably just that his stomach is empty at the moment, so that's why we can't see it. His esophagus is probably fine, which is probably actually what turned out to be the case. Um, but then at 24 weeks, the scan was far more concerned, like the impressions we were getting from the, from the people we were seeing, and, and it wasn't Dr. Thomas that day, were, were far more concerning. Um, but that something was seriously wrong. Um, and so we hadn't had any kind of antenatal testing done, not even the kind of ordinary 13 week nuchal scan, which often screens for Down syndrome. Um, and so we went ahead with a blood test um, that would pick up some of those main chromosomal abnormalities. Um, and it was just testing my blood. Um, so it wasn't particularly invasive or anything. Um, and I think the, one of the hardest periods was kind of the few days where we were trying to decide if we, if we did that test. Um, because the things that they were seeing on the scan weren't particularly, like they weren't things that you would line up and go, okay, that's, that's Down syndrome. Um, and the other options were a lot scarier. Down syndrome felt like something that one could cope with. Um, but the other, particularly the other two trisomies that will seemed more likely um, were kind of somewhere between one and ten babies survive, depending on which web page you look at. And um, they might learn to talk and they might learn to walk if they survive. Um, and so deciding whether to find that out was really hard. Um, once that came back and we were low risk for all those things, we were fairly confident that wasn't, wasn't the case and, and that made it easier. Um, but still then wondering what, what it was going to be like it was quite challenging. Um, thankfully, we were at the Marta and I don't know whether being a Catholic hospital that made it any better, easier. Um, nobody suggested that we terminate. Um, there was, I think, twice at a scan early on. Um, the statement was made, like a sentence included the phrase, if you choose to continue. Um, and we just said, yeah, that's, that's not, you don't need to worry about <laughs> that if, that we, we will continue. Um, and, and everyone was really um, accepting of that. Like we didn't, we didn't have to push. I've heard so many stories of people who did have to push it and everything was going to do. Um, I think one thing that I found really helpful at the time was I, I just happened to be listening to a Christian podcast um, where a woman was interviewing a woman who had had a, a baby with far more severe issues um, and she had been told to terminate because there was no way the baby was going to survive and the long story short was that her baby didn't die until the baby was four years old um, and so they had four beautiful years with this, with this little girl um, and she talked about how even though they always knew that she wasn't going to survive to adulthood, it, it, um, it was a blessing for her and her family and her older children, because we have two older children. And, um, and so just hearing somebody else talk it through and go, yes, it was very hard, um, but yes, it was a blessing from God and it was worth it, was worth it even though it was hard. I, I found that really helpful at the time. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's much else to say, but feel free to come and ask me questions later <laughs> if, if you want. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for your care of us. Well, uh, I must say that uh, um, I must thank the parents, uh, not only Katie and her family, but also other families who allow us to be part of this journey of agony almost of uh, decision making. Sometimes. Um, we don't know which way it will go, but we have to let the parents choose whatever they choose. Um, now, it's always hard when you have to choose for a struggle. Would you choose to struggle? Whose fault is it? What went wrong? 
Katie must be thinking, is it the coffees I had? Is it something that we had? Is it the hay fever? What, whose fault is it? Who caused this to happen? And I keep, kept asking this all the time. Why did God let this happen to me? Nearly half of all pregnancies are lost. Before they, before, some even before the mothers know that they are pregnant. 20% of babies are lost after a heartbeat is not cleaned. What causes me to know this? Oh, this went on. What are my beliefs? What am I here for? What am I doing? You know, what has God called me to do? Uh, is it all part of God's work? Is this how God runs things? If so, he's a, not a very efficient God because if 50% of all conceptions are being lost, what's happening? Of course, we have 7 billion people here on earth. Did he really want women to go through pain? Of course, the church was much against, uh, up in arms, against epidural and, and analgesia in labor, because that was what God wanted. So what happened? Did we read it all wrong? Did we get it wrong? The women an afterthought of God. I mean, I wanted to ask James Smith this, this morning, but you know, I mean, we're doing a series on women and God, women and men and church or something. Um, because it does seem to indicate, seemingly, that women were not created together with the man. Uh, at least that's how we read it. Uh, so what, what happened? What, what, what is the Bible saying? Did the Bible really say that? What, what on earth am I doing as a fetal medicine specialist, uh, telling women that their babies may not survive, or that tubing, feeding tube may not be there when we don't know half of what we are talking about. What do I tell parents? Fearfully and wonderfully made? Or something went wrong? Can I honestly tell them that this is God's plan and will for them? You know, especially, I'm, I'm sure God's, you know, it'll all work out together for good. I'm happy to accept that. But is this God's primary intention? Is this what uh, God wanted? to happen. My sanity, I mean, I was going mad. <laughs> you, you asked too many questions, you didn't go mad. Um, was, was, was a book called The Core by Os Guinness, where he actually talks about redefining things for yourself. And two people who had a profound influence on my life, uh, MC Matthew, who most of you won't know, um, from India, and Frank Garlick, uh, a good friend of ours, you know, who knew me uh, even from the days in India. And of course, Teresa is nodding her head. And the last uh, influence that I had was the uh, course that I did in uh, Regent College. Uh, I think Paul uh, knowingly or unknowingly sort of directed me towards that. Um, and I had a good two years uh, course uh, done there. It's leadership, theology, and society. How does what we believe um, affect uh, what we do. And Steve Garber uh, was an excellent chair for market risk theology in Regent College. This is a book that profoundly affected uh, my thinking, uh, what the Old Testament really says and why it matters, Seriously Dangerous Religion by Ian Poole. Um, and the fact that the Old Testament, as we know it, the Torah and the Tanakh, was born into a cradle of civilization. It was not into empty space that God spoke. It was the ancient Near East, it was the Mesopotamian, it's the Egyptian uh, cultures and religion into which uh, the Old Testament was born into and into which God spoke. He did not spoke, speak into a, uh, into a space which was empty of thinking. It's actually seen as Jewish meditation literature, yes, God's word but it is written by uh, men, mostly men, uh, because female literacy was down in the dumps those days. And we have to accept that there's a lot of uh, influence of theology uh, on art and art on theology. Um, and if we deny that, we are actually denying the influence of culture on our own thinking. Uh, the whole Genesis chapter 1 is born into this concept of the universe that they had at that time of a flat earth and a fir firmament above, the heavens above the firmament. 
it, and the waters above it, and the waters below it, and uh, uh, Gehenna or Sheol beneath the earth. But we won't ever say any of this is right. Um, but this is how we read it. This is how Genesis chapter 1 comes into being, talking about the heavens above, uh, God creating all that they saw was in this conceptualization and in the conceptualization of a temple uh, of the Near East where the images were there in every temple. In fact, some of the kings called themselves sons of God because they were so uh, royal, or they were so important and they made people work for them. And into this context, God says, no, they are not your gods. The sun is not your god. The moon is not your god. The stars are not your god. The animals are not your god. The sons of God who call themselves the sons of God are not gods. Your kings, your rulers are not your gods. I am your god. I made everything that you see. The time, the seasons, and everything material and immaterial that you see. And I have made you, created you as my image not as the idol that are sitting in the temples, but you are the images of God. And I want you to rule over everything as my images. So do we talk of Genesis chapter 1 as a chronological event, as talking about material creation? No, it's not about material creation. It's not about chronology. It's about this talking of God into this you know, I mean, potpourri of cultures and religion and saying, no, get away from all of this. I am your creator God. You are my images. You are my temple. No, you're not. No, you're not. You are the temple. And this, uh, John Walton goes into detail in this book, The Lost World of Genesis 1, what it really means to be made in the image of God in our day. You know, I mean, it's not anything physical. It's not anything. God attributing it to us, saying, you are being made, male and female, you are my images, not the sons of God, not the rulers, not the princes around you, not any of the creatures, but you are my images, and you are to rule over this. Now, what do we do about Genesis chapter 2, when the woman is coming towards the end of the chapter? Is Genesis chapter 2 about anesthesia? because it says that man was put to sleep. Is it about the first surgery that was made? Because it says the rib was taken out and the woman made out of uh, the rib. The artists have tried very hard to give, um, give some kind of a depiction of this. And this is the closest I could get to um, out of my internet search, a woman coming out of the side of man. But really, again, is it about any of this? Is it about chronology? Is it about timing? No, it is about relationship. Bestiality is not anything new for the 21st century. It existed among the Mesopotamian and the ancient Near East. And there God is saying, look, animals are not to be in relationship with you. You are to rule over them. Who are you to be in relationship? Is a woman who is flesh of your flesh, bone of your bone, made by, you know, in the same uh, species or whatever. So it was about relationships and not about chronology, not about timing. So therefore, when Paul talks about it in Timothy, saying Adam was created first, <coughs> he is only recounting from what the Torah and the Tanakh says. He is not, again, talking about chronology, though he, he seemingly is uh, confirming that, yes, Adam was made first and Eve was made second. And of course, that has created a whole lot of harm, not only just in the church, but also in the Western civilization and patriarchal, matriarchal society that Jane Snell spoke about today is partly dominance that both men and women uh, are attempting in different ways. And as Nelson Mandela said, dominance of the white race against the black race was wrong. But any dominance of any kind is wrong. And that's scriptural. Now, Imago Dei, made in the image of God, who does it refer to? Is it referred to those of us who have capacities 
or those who do not have capacities, or is it an attribute of relation, relationality that God gives to all human beings, ascribed to all human as persons? So then the question comes, when does human life begin, if not at conception? Of course, the safest and the best answer is that the potential for human life begins at conception. There is no, no other time that we can see um, where you could say, yes, this is another point in time where there is uh, a difference. Except when we talk and see in terms of viability, it's only after 23, 24 weeks that a fetus can live outside of the mother's womb. There are lots of theories that come about. One is this ensoulment of a body. The other is embodiment of a soul. How do we think of this? Is a soul getting encapsulated into somebody's body? Is, or is a body getting invaded by a soul? And depending on your worldview and depending on what you believe, something or the other becomes right. Because the Jewish thinking is that ensoulment so till eight weeks or 10 weeks, the embryo is just an embryo, <coughs> like any other embryo, chick embryo, goat embryo, whatever. And insolvent occurs at eight weeks. I don't know how it occurs. And then you can't abort. But before that, abortion is all right. The Islamic faith, they think that insolvent occurs at 16 weeks. So the termination for them is all right in 16 weeks. But after that, is not allowed. How do we look at all of this? At what point do we have a human person? It's a, it's a hard question, and I don't think I have an answer for that. Except to say that we don't have clear-cut answers given in the Bible as to when or if uh, there is a gestation at which termination is right. I look, look, look at a few scriptures uh, in time. But this is a man that many of us are familiar with, at least those of us who read uh, theology books, um, N.T. Wright, Tom Wright. Um, most of you have heard his name. Uh, he's written a lot of books. Um, he's in the UK, um, I don't know whether he's in Scotland now or down in England somewhere. Um, Surprised by Hope is a good uh, writing that encompasses a whole lot of challenging thinking where he says that this whole notion of body and soul being separate is actually pagan. In the Jewish literature, or in the Old Testament, there is no suggestion that there is an existence of a soul apart from the body. That we are an integrated whole, body, mind, and spirit together. In fact, the witch of Endor 